Hi and welcome to today's live chapter reading of Moonlit Kiss by Amy McKinley, courtesy of Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter 1 Stepping off the plane at Marco Polo Airport felt like a homecoming so real, so undeniable that my throat clenched. A mist of tears coated my eyes and I clutched the arm of a stranger. I'd been there before, just not in this lifetime. I'd often heard tales of one psyche recognising places, ties from the past, even soulmates. And to me, Venice, Italy was home. After all, Mum was from Tuscany. Why Venice felt so familiar was perplexing, but it was surely due to her family's history in Italy. Mum had emigrated to America with her family when she was young. I'd grown up on Italian food and stories from both my grandparents. I spoke the language fluently and longed to someday visit my ancestral homeland in the rural hills of Tuscany. When I met Francesca, who hired me to restore a fresco painting in Venice, and since Mum's cancer was in remission, it was an opportunity I just couldn't pass up. After leaving the airport, I should have found the villa I'd be staying at rent-free to unpack and get a good night's sleep. That wasn't happening. Wired from the long flight, I decided to experience the floating city under the moonlight. From where I dread, the winding streets of Venice were safe for a woman at night, so I had no worries. Besides, it was dark and Francesco Marcello's mural home would have to wait a few hours until daylight anyway. I was glad it was the fall, the perfect time to visit Venice with its cooler temperatures and tourist season ending. After a change of footwear, then sharing a water taxi, I strolled through the winding street, my rolling suitcase bumping along behind me towards Piazza San Marco, or St Mark's Square. The heavy perfume of fall flowers mixed with the salt from nearby water coated the air. The sky darkened and the moon cast its rays on age-old buildings seeped in history. My pace slowed to take in the antique Gothic architecture, studying its classic beauty. For once, I didn't worry about losing my way. Under the amber glow of street lamps, minutes dipped while I feasted my eyes on fresco, or a fresco, aka painting into lime plaster, done in brilliant contours. My rubber boot clad feet led the way and I came upon the piazza as if I'd strolled the same path hundreds of times. Not once had I needed to refer to the map I'd pulled up on my phone. It was as if I'd been there before and walked those streets hundreds of times already. Maybe I had in another lifetime. How else can I explain my intimate knowledge of the winding streets of Venice when I'd never stepped foot on the floating city? Enticing notes of music lured me around a corner to an orchestra stand in front of Ristorante. Bright lights reflected in the partially flooded square. My heart kicked up a notch and my soul sighed as strains of Vivaldi's renowned summer concerto near the thunderous pitch of the storm and urged me to stay a while. Tourists and locals wandered the outer edges of the square on the passerelle walkways elevated above the water, and the reflection shimmered in the rippling surface that filled the inner portion of the plaza. The flooding from the Adriatic Sea Lagoon was minimal. I soaked up the sights around me, giddy that I was standing amid such history. My gaze started from one iconic building to the next. The Basilica San Marco Church dominated the east side of the square, flanked by the Campanile di San Marco Bell Tower. I ordered wine and cecchetti, Venetian tapas styled finger food, then found a seat furthest from the rising water. Inviting laughter and companionable conversation floated around me as I sipped my wine. The bell tolled nine o'clock. Easing back in my chair, I watched people and snacked as a concerto transitioned to autumn, then winter with dramatic and emotional tempo shifts. The pul my pulse pounded in time with the violin strains as excitement overwhelmed my senses. This is where I'm meant to be. I'd snatched up the offer to work in Venice, without a second thought, as the floating city was a place I'd planned to visit someday. Since I was there, I couldn't imagine leaving when the painting was completed. There was something so magical about the place. My mealtime in the square passed much too quickly. 
Ten o'clock neared. I'd promised Francesca, whom I'd instantly liked when she first contacted me about the job, a phone call when I'd arrived. She was in her early seventies, and I worried the hour was too late. Better do that now. A cool breeze from the lagoon sent goosebumps dancing along my skin, and I tugged my light cardigan close around my body, warding off the early October chill. Digging through my backpack, I found my cell, then scrolled through the contacts to locate Francesca's number. I pressed the button to contact the call, then waited. It rang twice before she picked up. I filled her in, sharing that I had arrived and had stopped for a bite to eat. I'm so glad you got there safely, Jana. The flight was uneventful, which is what I'd hoped for. How's your vacation so far? She wasn't there to greet me because she was travelling with several close friends. It's wonderful, she sighed. We arrived in France tonight and then are off to Spain, then Portugal. I hope you'll be all right alone in the villa. Of course. The final strains of Vivaldi's Winter Concerto heralded the end of the orchestra's entertainment. I chose not to stay until the bell tolled at midnight, when a city would begin to shut down. I stifled a yawn, then stood and slung my backpack over my shoulder, my phone pressed to my ear. I'm looking forward to working on the mural at first light. Oh no, not tomorrow. Her voice was warbled. I've arranged for you to take a gondola ride to soak in the atmosphere of Venice during the daytime. Think of it as creative inspiration. I attempted to decline, but Francesca wouldn't take no for an answer. Before we hung up, I agreed to her generous offer. Beneath the glow of the sleep ramps, I turned the corner, dragging my luggage through hidden alleys and bridges passing over small inlets. One by one, shadows cast by each gas lamp led me through a dark labyrinth. No map could have guided me so well. I would be staying in Francesca's villa for the next few months, working a dream job that I couldn't believe I'd landed. Francesca was a supporter of a non-profit dedicated to preserving Venice's artistic heritage. While I wasn't a member of that particular organisation, she sought me out after seeing several of my restoration projects and my own artwork. I shivered. The night was changing. War air mixed with the dropping evening temperatures. Ushering in tendrils of fog that wafted in long strips along the canal, like eerie fingers seeking something that I evaded their grasp. Adjusting my backpack, I again tugged my cardigan tightly around my body and quickened my pace. The map featured on my phone shoved back in the pocket. The villa was a few blocks away and across the canal. A sense of deja vu nipped at me as I made my way down the meandering streets, which I didn't ne seem to need the map for. How is this familiar? There will be a bridge not too far ahead where I will cross. On the other side will be the Marcello home. I was to have the first of four floors to myself and Francesca said no one else would be in residence for a couple of weeks. A wave of fatigue swept over me as I walked through the tufts of mist. It was late and I wanted to find my room. The fog thickened and icy awareness tiptoed along my spine, feeling a sense of familiarity as I passed the stretch of cafes and shops. The old world charm of the buildings played an enticing game of peekaboo through the haze. I wanted to stop and study their exquisite designs before I lost sight of them altogether. It was after ten and a hush had descended over the city of canals and I felt the history's presence acutely. I rubbed my arms as I frowned at the eerie heavy clouds affected my sense of well-being. My ears played tricks on me and I swore the deep timbre of a man's voice echoed through the dense air. I tried to shake the unease that scratched along my skin. I must have been having an auditory hallucination. Maybe it was a weird trick of the fog. Time stilled as a cloud-like mass tumbled through the streets, distorting my sense of direction. An anguished cry echoed around me. I stumbled before catching myself, the feeling of deja vu so strongly that I questioned my reality. Sophia! I gasped. The deep baritone made it feel like a vice circled my heart. I paused and chills erupted over my body. I know that voice. Anguish dripped from his voice and my feet remained rooted in place. His desperate bellow spurred me to action and I raced blindly through the dense haze, running to him instead of away. My footsteps studied on the pavement, my luggage careening precariously behind me. A minute passed, then another. 
he continued to shout, the tormented sound echoing along the canal and bouncing off the residences that flanked it. A flash of light danced across the water's lapping surface. I skidded to a halt, mere steps from plummeting in. A scuffle sounded to my left and I turned. There, not more than a foot away, the fog parted to reveal an imposing man, perhaps a few years senior to my twenty-five, dressed in black trousers and a worried white down button shirt. His haunting grey gaze collided with mine. My heart swelled, its tempo increasing to alarming rates, and I drowned in my own pain, gasping through my intense agony. Even if only a dream, I'd seen him before, and had it needed to look to recognise those grey eyes, how they'd once unnerved me, and how they still could. Wavy, dark mahogany hair that tended to defy all attempts to tame it brushed the edges of his collar. My fingers curled and a desire to touch the soft strands beat in my chest. How I knew him I didn't fully understand. Nothing made sense. Not my reactions or my actions since I set foot in the floating city. Tears rolled unchecked down my face and my eyelids drifted shut. Time stood still. It was impossible, but... I knew the man somehow. Tremors shook my hands until I clasped them together. I sent his, sensed his approach. My body responded. It always had and always would. I felt a cool feather-like touch on my face as he swept back a few strands that had fallen from my messy bun, as if he'd done it a thousand times before. My lips tingled as he brushed across mine in the lightest of caresses. The spicy tang of leather and whiskey tears my awareness, and I open my eyes. What am I doing? A loving? The deep sense of longing continued to suffocate me. I dropped my gaze to his lips and swayed. Forbidden. I wanted to bargain with him, with fate. One taste was all I wanted. He's not real. I've missed you. His husky voice wrapped me in a drugging desire. Every night I've searched for you, Sophia. With a deep inhalation, I forced myself to face what I feared wasn't really there. Tilting my head to meet his gaze, I felt an icy chill on my cheek before his hand fell away. I blinked up at the stunning man towering over me. Arresting, chiselled features complemented a well-built frame that looked as if he could carry the weight of the world. It was an illusion. Neither of us could. I dreamed of him, but I hadn't imagined him to be real. I'm not... Shh, my love, his eyes misted. It's my fault, all of it. I had to get away from the madness. Maybe it's the wine. I tore my gaze from him and looked around. The fog coated everything in each direction. I could only see a foot in front of me on all sides. I was impossibly turned around, but not alone. The seconds ticked as we stood before one another. I had no choice. I'm afraid I'm lost. A sad mild curve, smile curved his lips, as I have been my sweet. He moved to stand beside me. Come, I'll walk you home. A fierce frown marred his face and I stuck a tip back. But not there, not to him. Him who? No one was supposed to be in the house. I'm staying across the river at the Marcello home. A dazzling smile curved his kissable lips and his body melted. The moment of weariness fled. That's where I planned to take you. I was a fool to do it, but I walked with him anyway. We fell into a companionable silence, our shoes scuffling along the cobbled stones. By his side, I felt safe. I wanted to learn more about him. The streets of Venice weren't known to be dangerous, and I didn't have a lot to lose. The haze that encased the island had somehow soaked into my brain. I shook my head, trying to rid my mind of the hold the young man seemed to have over me. Who are you? He paused and turned to look at me. I mirrored his movements. Alarm briefly lit his eyes until sadness darkened, darkened them from grey to obsidian. Giovanni, I am your Sophia and you are mine. I've waited so long. Now that you're here, I must confess my deep regret for putting you at risk for a foolish day by the shore. This has gone on long enough. While I wanted to cling to every word he said, I was an imposter to his memory. My damaged mind, he needed to know. My conscience couldn't carry the weight of leading him on. Something was wrong. 
and I didn't want to contribute to his pain. I'm sorry, Giovanni, for whatever happened to Sofia. My fingers stretched out to touch him before I thought better of it. But I'm not her. He gestured for us to continue down the walkway. I will forever envision you in the arms of the gods, he purred sensually, as if I hadn't spoken to deny his delusion. A frown pulled at his lips. Perhaps if we tossed a coin, they would have watched over us, and we would have encountered only tame, waster, tame waters. I couldn't follow his riddles and chose to let them roll off me. We turned. Nausea punched me in the gut as we travelled between two houses and stepped onto a bridge that spanned the distance over the canal. A swift jolt of sickness left me as soon as we arrived on the other side. Weird. The entire encounter had been odd. He paused and I followed his gaze. My sight caught from the impact of the astonishing fresco painting, and I humbly devoured the moonlit sight before me. The mural. I was intimately acquainted with it, as I'd been commissioned to work on it. Giovanni's joys jolted me back to the fact that I wasn't alone. My second regret is that it wasn't finished in time, and as such I could not leave.